Welcome to Life Church Panania. Thank you for joining us today. We're your hosts. I'm Ian. And I'm Eleanor. And today we're looking at Bible prophecy, particular interesting, obscure things like the abomination of desolation and the great tribulation, the destruction of the temple. But as bad as that is, let's aim for something that is really encouraging. We will today be celebrating the Lord's Supper. So I hope you've got something or can quickly grab something that you can use for your bread and your wine during this part of our service. But let's begin with prayer. Our Father, we know just by looking at uh, the TV, the world is a, a broken place. There are so many terrible things that happen uh, in this world. Wars and rumours of war and, and famine and pestilence. And even at a personal level, bad things happen. But you're a God of grace. You're a God of love. You're a God of compassion. So thank you for embracing us and keeping us to yourself. Oh, that we would respond now with hearts full of gratitude and praise. Oh, guide us through our service, we pray now. In Jesus' name, amen. We've got a couple of songs of faith and courage. So oh, let's sing them. You know these very well. So let's sing them together. Let the flame burn brighter. of the flame as Christ burns in us. And now this song again, a song of faith and courage. When things are difficult, God's name is still to be praised. Let's sing, Blessed Be Your Name. Streams of abundance 
When the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering, though there's pain in the offering. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. And when the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will stay. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glory. name is to be blessed. Now, what's coming up? What do we need to know about this week? Tomorrow, our church council have got their regular monthly meeting. Uh, please be in prayer that uh, God's wisdom will be available to them. And then on Wednesday, if you can join us at Panania East Hills RSL Club, known to the locals as Diggers, then you're welcome to come and join us and we'll look at our Go Deeper questions. And then next Sunday is Mother's Day. And I hope you can uh, be there to remember mum at uh, church. Uh, also, we're about to um, experience the coronation of King Charles III. Uh, and we would all say, long live the king, God bless the king, and may indeed he stand for godly values. Here's the focal point of our service, and it is the Lord's Supper, and we come to gather with him at his table. Now, it, it comes with a, um, a precursor. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, what are you doing? You are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. Everyone ought to examine themselves. So we look at ourselves and know that we are unworthy, but we look at what God has done in our lives, and that's why we proclaim his death, which gives us life. Let us pray. Father, thank you for the simplicity of this reminder. It's just bread. It's just the cup. It's nothing great, but it's a symbol of a great thing that's been done at Calvary as Jesus gave his life to pay the penalty for our sin and gave us his righteousness in return. We examine ourselves and confess to you, yes, we are unworthy. We disappoint you and others and ourselves ever so often. Thank you for your forgiveness and grace, and we celebrate that through this supper, and we do so in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, 
and gave it to them, his disciples, saying, This is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So take your bread and break it and eat it. And as you do so, with a heart of thanksgiving, remember Jesus. Then he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. So take your cup. And again, reminding yourselves that things are now new. This is a new covenant, a new relationship that God has established with you because Jesus poured out his blood for you. So drink this cup. And as you do so, remember Jesus. Father, thank you for our Saviour. Thank you for the salvation that you give to us. Thank you for the great future you have in store for us because we are forgiven and restored and made righteous in your sight. Things that we could never do for ourselves, you have done for us. And so we come before you with thanksgiving and say simply, thank you. Thank you for all that you've done. And especially, thank you for Jesus. And we give you thanks in his name. Amen. How appropriate then that one of the ways in which we can say thanks to God is by our financial gifts that we're able to bring. Uh, thank you to those of you who do support the church and our mission. The uh, account number's there. This way you keep control of your money and it's simply that you can put it into the church's account so that we can distribute it as your gift to God and his people. Thank you. We've got another couple of songs, a couple of great songs. This wonderful hymn is uh, one that has several tunes to it. I hope you like this one. It's a lovely tune. So sing along with us as we sing, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less Than Jesus.
indeed we have a sure and certain hope. And what a beautiful name he has. Oh, all that the name Jesus means. So as you sing this, let your mind dwell on the words, because Jesus, what a beautiful name. for the beauty of Jesus. And now we're going to turn to God's Word. We open up the Scriptures, and once again we're in the book of Luke. It's a long passage. So hear what Jesus says about the future. Hear the Word of the Lord. Jesus said, See to it that you are not deceived, for many will come in my name, claiming, I am he, and the time is near. Do not follow them. When you hear of wars and rebellions, do not be alarmed. These things must happen first, but the end is not imminent. Then he told them, Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, famines, and pestilences in various places, along with fearful sights and great signs from heaven. But before all this, they will seize you and persecute you. On account of my name, they will deliver you to the synagogues and prisons, and they will bring you before kings and governors. This will be your opportunity to serve as witnesses. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You are alive, so you have a future. You can be, you can trust Jesus with your future. These verses show us why you can trust Jesus with your future. And the verses 
that we have are part of what's called the Olivet Discourse. Now, you probably don't need to know that. It's what the theologians call it. But the problem is that some people say it happened all so long ago. And there's other people who say, oh, no, it's still all in the future. There is actually a better way to look at it. And that's what we're going to do now. We're going to pick the middle ground. And it looks like this. The disciples had two problems. Jesus spoke two prophecies. And then he gave two parables to make it clear. What we are going to do today is look at the first of these set of prophecies that Jesus has. So what are the lessons we learn? There are three of them. The first is, Jesus can be trusted with my future. He can be trusted in my good times. One of the songs that we sometimes sing is a reminder that there's something beautiful and something good, and he's making something beautiful out of our lives. How does he do that? Well, the first thing to note is we must not hold on to the past. When we hold on to the past, the past holds on to us. So let's have a look at what Jesus was saying in their context. Some of the disciples were with Jesus in the temple, remarking how the temple was adorned with all these beautiful stones and consecrated gifts. But Jesus' response is, not one stone will be left upon another. So when we look backwards, what are the things that we need to learn? We look back and we have to admit, we've all had bad things done to us. And there are times when we've done the, the dumb thing, the bad thing. So how do we handle the past? The first is we need to remember the past. Remember it with some accuracy about what really happened. Because we can't deal with imagination. We can only deal with the reality. And for the bad things that have happened, we need to regret the past. We need to grieve over what happened. But we can't stay there. We need to move to a place where we release the past, let it go. And if we're the ones who were the problem child, then we need to repent of that and not allow that to continue to hold us down and build some resilience. The past is not me. I'm coming out of the past. And rejoice over the past. There are good things that have happened. Don't let the bad overshadow the good. Celebrate what God is doing in your life because he's doing more good than bad. And then repay more than the past took from you. Repay yourself. Repay others. And the best way to do that is through thanksgiving. You can break out of your past. And then we do not need to fear what the future holds for us. So the disciples ask what the future held. When will these things happen? What will be the sign they're about to take place? They were looking to the future. Jesus' answer was, see to it that you are not deceived. Many will come in my name claiming, I am he, the time is near. Jesus' answer is, do not follow them. Well, that's exactly what happened. Jesus knew the future. And the theologians tell us within one year of our Lord's ascension uh, arose this particular fellow who with boldness asserted that he was the Messiah. And look, time doesn't permit. There is just screeds of others who followed in that same vein. There are wars and rumors of wars. What's to be our response to that? Jesus says, don't be alarmed. Don't be alarmed. These things must happen. That's not the end. You see, the world is broken. Wars and rumors of wars and rebellions, that's part and parcel of the world because it's broken by sin. But we are not looking at the bad. We're looking up. We've got a Father who loves us. We've got a Savior who is our security. We've got the Holy Spirit who is our comforter. Jesus can be trusted in my good times and he can be trusted in my hard times as well. Jesus had said earlier, uh, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. Uh, you will have troubles in this world. Be courageous. I have conquered the world. So here's good news. We've got troubles, but within the troubles, we've got peace. And we've got peace because we've got courage. And we've got courage because we've got Jesus, even in the hard times. And so we know that hard times 
are normal. Jesus went on to say, nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And that's exactly what happened because he knows the future. The Roman historian Tacitus said, I'm entering on the history of a period rich in disasters, frightened in its wars, torn by civil strife, and even in peace, full of horrors. Four emperors perished by the sword. There were civil wars and more wars with foreign armies. There was often war. Jesus was quite right. He went on to say, there'll be earthquakes, famines, pestilences, great signs. And that's exactly what happened. Again, the historian tells us houses flattened by repeated earthquakes. The terror spread. The weak were trampled to death by the panic-stricken crowd. Further portents were seen in the shortage of grain resulting in famine. Jesus knew all that was coming. <clears throat> and he gets no more personal now. But before all this... They will seize you, persecute you on account of my name. They'll deliver you to synagogues and prisons. And guess what? That's exactly what happened. Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke. He then went on and wrote Volume 2, which is the book of Acts. And there he catalogued again and again the things that were the fulfillment of all that Jesus had to say. But while I can trust Jesus in my hard times, which are normal... Hard times are also my opportunity. Jesus said, this will be your opportunity to serve as witnesses. And once again, uh, we have the record in Scripture. This is exactly what happened because Jesus knows our future. And so as another of our songs sings, I'm not afraid. I'm not dismayed. What am I doing? I'm walking in faith and victory. And why? For the Lord your God is with you. But some of you will even be put to death. Again, Jesus knew that, and that's exactly what happened. Jesus can be trusted in my good times. He can be trusted in my hard times. He knows all my times. And he'd be trusted in my change times, when things are in turmoil, when things are in the midst of change. Jesus is there with it. And so what we learn is Jesus provides my better way forward. We read in scripture, there isn't any temptation that you have experienced, which is unusual. God, who is faithfully keeps his promises, will not allow you to be tempted beyond your power to resist. But when you're tempted, he will also provide a way of escape. Mm, sounds good in theory. How does it work in practice? So, well, let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. And reading on a little bit. If anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be available for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master, ready for every good work. Therefore, this is how to put it into practice. Therefore, Flee from lusts that trap the young, and instead pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. And Jesus said, goes on to say, looking to the future, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, you'll know that her desolation is near. Now, again, the theologians call this the abomination of desolation. And Jesus said, when that happens, let those in Judea flee to the mountains. Get out of the city. <laughs> if you're not in the city, don't come into the city. And so that's exactly what happened. Jesus knows what your future looks like. And so it was that the Romans marched in from the north, crushed the rebellion in Galilee, then down to uh, Jerusalem, and then... They turned away. How and why did that happen? Jesus saw it was going to happen and provided that as the way of escape. And the historian records this. Then it happened that Cestius, who's the Roman legate uh, in charge of the army, was not conscious, he was not aware either of how the besieged inside Jerusalem despaired of success. They, they knew they were doomed. Nor did Cestius realize how courageous the people were for him. His own army were ready to go to battle. So what did he do? He recalled his soldiers from the place and 
by despairing of any expectation of taking it. He wasn't ready for the siege. He was ready to leave. Without having received any disgrace, he was meaning he was not defeated in battle. He retired from the city without re any reason in the world. And so it was that the Romans packed up and left, and the believers were then able to free, um, flee. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then let those in Judea flee to the mountains. Uh, let those in the city get out, said Jesus. He knew what was coming. He can be trusted with your future. And those who believed him went here. Uh, the, another historian writes, the whole body of the church at Jerusalem having been commanded by a divine revelation, this is Jesus' prophecy that we're just reading, given to men of approved piety there before the war, he told the disciples, and those Christians removed from the city and dwelt in a certain town beyond the Jordan called Pella. And so it was when the Romans went west, the Christians went east, and then turned and dwelt in you know, Pella. Pella is a city in a non-Jewish, Gentile, Roman area called Decapolis, and there they were safe. But there are those who don't obey Jesus. There are those who want to go their own way, make their own plans, think that they can do it without him. Unfortunately, Jesus warns of a worse way forward. And he says, for these are the days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. Again, the historian writes, uh, Those that believed in Christ, having removed from Jerusalem as if holy men had entirely abandoned the royal city itself and the land of Judea, then what happened? The divine justice for their crimes against Christ and his apostles finally overtook them, totally destroying the whole generation of evildoers from the earth, exactly as Jesus had predicted. He also said how miserable things will be in those days for the pregnant and for the nursing mothers, for there will be great distress on the land and wrath against his people. That's what the theologians call the Great Tribulation. And how terrible it was, uh, daytime spent in shedding blood and the night in fear. There is so much I could tell you, but it's so sickening. I had no intention of doing that. Jesus went on to say, they'll fall by the edge of the sword, be led captive into the nations. And it's exactly what happened, as Jesus predicted. Uh, we don't know exactly how many people were killed because, you know, who knows what became of the bodies. But we're talking about three quarters of a million people killed in the siege, almost 100,000 prisoners taken. Males aged 17 and older were put into hard labour camps to uh, erect buildings in Rome where they made gladiators to be killed for the amusement of the spectators in the Colosseum. Women and children were sold into slavery and scattered around the empire. And, Jesus, and Jerusalem will be trodden down by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. Jerusalem's time's over. The Jews' time is over. It, now is the new covenant. Now is our time, just as Jesus predicted. And so what have we got for us? This is the, the end result of all that. You, you, Lord, will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Jesus knows what's in our future. He tells us how to avoid the bad, how to accept the good. We need to walk closely with him because that's the path of life, the path to the fullness of joy and the path to the pleasures evermore. Jesus can indeed be trusted with my future and it's a future worth holding on to. Hold on to Jesus and the future that he's holding on to you. And now here is our song of response. We can shine like the light because Jesus shines in us. In a dark world, in dark times, the light of the gospel is shining into us and through us. So let's sing together the celebration song, The Light.
Lord, thank you for shining your light into our lives. May we be your light in a dark world, a light that grows ever stronger as the world grows ever darker. May Jesus live in us, reign in us, and shine through us. We ask in Jesus' own name. Amen. Well, thank you for being part of our service today. And now, who are you going to tell that you went to church online? There are so many ways that you could do that. And I hope you take the opportunity to take the next step. Because our purpose for you is to help you be a follower of Jesus and to make others be followers of Jesus. Thank you for being part of our service today. Now, let's have a nice cup of tea.